All right, good, good evening. Uh, today is Friday, it's September the 14th, 2012. And uh, the significance of that is um, because on November 6, 2012, there's an election. So we have about 50 or 51 or 52 days remaining. Uh, that's the countdown. And so what it's going to be, what's the, uh, you know, paper is going to say on November 7th, that um, we elected Republicans and Democrats again who are leading us in circles, or, um, you know, maybe tried uh, independent and third party candidates who are going to take their oath seriously and who are going to bring up issues that never get discussed in the debates with the Republicans and Democrats. And um, so that's what we're doing. We're doing the candidate interviews and we're going to have up to 50 interviews among the hundreds of candidates. And today we have Ron Williams um, running in the fourth district here. Um, and his opponents are Stephen Palazzo and Robert Clanch. And so um, Ronald, it's great to talk to you. And that is, let me just check here. So I've been going through a lot of interviews here. That's in Mississippi, right? That's correct, Tom. All right. Thank you, Ron. And, um, well, thank you. And please tell us um, a little bit about what motivated you this year in 2012 to, you know, get on the ballots. I mean, you're not just going to cast a vote this year. You're on the ballots. And also, um, so what motivates you a little bit about yourself and a little bit about, uh, you know, the 4th District of Mississippi for those who might not have ever visited? Tom, the 4th District is, is, a, is a great place to be. It's a vital part of Mississippi. It's a vital part of our nation. Uh, I was motivated. Uh, my wife and I were successful contractors for about 20 years. And over the past 20 years, we've, we've seen just a complete mismanagement of things in Washington. We've, you know, we, we spend a lot of time, we spend a lot of time as business owners talking with accountants just to make sure that we can get this, our, this complicated tax structure right, to make sure that we, we pay all the taxes we're supposed to pay. And then, and then you look at how it's all wasted. So, so I, I got motivated. I was motivated because I just got tired of the, of the BS, or, or the, for lack of a better word, going on in Washington. Nobody's being truthful with us. Now, back to the 4th District. We do a lot of military support down here. We have agricultural products. Uh, we have many folks in the poultry industry, uh, the timber industry. It, there's a very, very diverse uh, economy here. But the bottom line is this. Regardless of what you're doing to provide for your family, you're having to send money to Washington, and Washington is wasting it. And so here's, here's an important factor. No matter how well we do in the fourth district no matter how we try to budget ourselves no matter how we try to manage our lives and our financial situation responsible we're connected to this ship that we call the united states that's being run by the federal government well you know no matter how well we protect our, our area if the rest of the ship sinks we go down with it so as a concerned citizen i decided i would get involved and i would run for congress now i ran for governor of mississippi last year and I ran because of the same issues in Washington. We just a lot of a lot of dishonesty at our state capitol. And after the governor's race, uh, a lot of folks called me and asked me if I would consider running for Congress. And I said, Well, I will, but I'm not going to run as a Republican. I ran as a Republican last year, and I'll be honest with you, my eyes were opened up as I became more uh, more acquainted with the leadership of that party. And I've been a Republican all my life, uh, but I, I had been fooled. So anyhow. That's a long answer, Tom, but the fact of the matter is this. I'm running because I'm worried about this nation. I'm worried about what these young people that are coming behind us are going to inherit. We just need to do something. Yeah, um, and, and I think um, not running as a Republican, I think it sends a message. It sends a kind of message like that they've been sending us. I think they've been sending us a message as like, you know, I want you to fire me so I can collect unemployment. I'm trying to do everything I can possibly for you to fire me, but um, you just keep me um, here, you know? And um, so, I mean, they, they couldn't be asking for it anymore and let them collect their unemployment. They'll have a pension and stuff, um, unfortunately, but they'll still have that. And uh, so, um, and, and you know, so that, that that's the, the government spending. I mean, it'd be one thing if they're spending it on neutral or investing it maybe in getting at least some interest, but they're actually, I would argue, doing stuff that's actually negative um like like you, you know I, I mean they you know there's a lot of revolving doors and all the agencies that are meant to regulate like the fda and um the, you know the commerce departments and uh and and it helps the monopolies it helps the big companies i mean there's 95 percent of us businesses out here and people that want to have an equal playing field and 
um, not competing with all these um, companies that get bailouts, you know, the trillions we've spent in bailouts and no-bid contracts. And uh, another question is, um, I, and this is a real serious question, I mean, are we an empire? Um, is that what we're teaching our kids? Or are we still um, a republic? We are a republic, Tom. We're a republic. We have, we because of how our society has developed and because of the the lax mentality of the electorate, we have become kind of a socialist republic to, to some extent. Now, and what I say by that is this. I'm in favor of helping people out if they're down on their luck, okay? But we've become this nation of entitlements that everybody feels like they're owed something. Nobody's owed anything except the, the right to the pursuit of happiness. That's the only thing you're owed in this country. And, and you, you can go out and pursue it as hard as you want or as lackadaisical as you want, and the results will be based on that effort. But we've become this, this, uh, this semi-socialist society, and we've made it comfortable now to not achieve your best. We've made it comfortable to not make the effort. And, and in that context, we've, we've kind of shifted from a, a capitalist republic to a kind of a socialist, I wouldn't say we're empirical, but it's almost like a, a, a monarchy, except the monarchy is the government. And it's a funny thing because you can't really put your finger on who's the king. It's just the system has evolved to the point that government in itself... Whatever you want to call it, socialism, fascism, as some people do, mixture of corporation and states, or, um, y y you know, like uh, some people are calling it like a, a, a new... Um, you know, just kind of like back to the Middle Ages. I mean, it's tyranny. That's the bottom line. It's tyranny, and um, and that's what we don't want is tyranny. Like uh, where you know the people who have the clouts can set the rules, and um, you, you know, I mean, there's so many things like obstacles people have to go to to start their own business, and uh, uh, and and you know, there are laws that favor. Like, I mean, just look at the Republicans and the Democrats. I mean, they don't. They try to keep, you know, some people out of the debates and stuff like that. And um, so it's kind of a monopoly type attitude that, um, that shouldn't represent us. I mean, how can we, we, instead of always, you know, defending ourselves overseas, we also need to defend ourselves here to have justice and equal justice under the law, you know? It's funny you mention that because I just responded to an email from a gentleman about uh, HR 4959, which which takes away a lot of our freedoms. It's uh, you know it's one of these homeland security measures, and I trust me, I'm in favor of homeland security. I'm in favor of protecting our nation. But the the, the point I made was, if we have to give up our freedom to be free, is it worth it? Uh, and that's where we're headed in this country. No, I don't think it's ever worth it. I don't think we need to do that, though. I think. Um you know, we're strong as a free country. That's, I mean, that's what our strength is. It's being able to, you know, admit your mistakes, show your flaws, because it's kind of like, you know, like the comic book character Wolverine. When he gets slashed, he gets like, he heals himself, like almost superhumanly. And, and that's what a free society does, because when you, um, like, share your flaws, you know, then you can work on them, and then all the greatest minds can come together and uh, brainstorm, and um, and then we tend to, you know, heal really quickly, and, uh, and and you know, for the better with the extra wisdom that we've gained, and you know, to become smarter. So, yeah, I think you know the challenge is let's, you know, you know, kind of use our brain muscles a little bit harder and just try to figure out ways of protecting ourselves without violating our civil liberties. I'm sure we can come up with some good ways, you know. Absolutely. Look, the, I have no doubt that the American people and the people of the 4th Mississippi District, okay, if government will get out of our way, Americans can solve our problems. I mean, we've just, we have shown for centuries or, or well, for the last 200-something years, we're capable of solving whatever dilemma that we're facing. But we've gotten to the point now to where government just stifles or, or, or manipulates to the point that that American economic and, and innovative engine is not running at full speed. And if government will get out of the way, we can turn this country around. I mean, like uh, Clinton, I mean, I mean, really, I feel like we've had the lesser of two evils since, you know, probably, <laughs> well, maybe, it's, and some might disagree, that, like, um, at least the first George W. Bush, you know, and, um, or maybe Clinton, we can say Clinton. And, um, 
but either or, and, uh, and and then it's just been lesser to evil after lesser to evil, and I, I think um, the presidency might be a difficult way to get our Congress back because whoever gets elected, Romney or Obama, I mean that's not um, you, you know the, you know great news. That's not the good word, in other words, and. Um, that's just uh, you know getting fooled again, like the Who song. And um, but you know there is another um, way. It's Congress, and um, actually, and that's one of the um, branches, especially in the House, where you can elect someone new every two years. And so why do they make it two years? That seems like such a short time. You know, I mean, some people have actually suggested making it longer, but I mean that defeats the whole purpose. The purpose is as kind of an emergency in case we need to do it. And I would argue that, you know, um, I mean, just the State of the Union seems like, you know, we definitely need um, a re not only a new people, but a re and, and also a rejection of the Republicans and the Democrats as well. Well, Tom, here's the facts. This is just a, a blunt fact, the, the short and sweet of it. If you look at a chart of America's debt since about 1977, it goes straight up almost. There are a couple of, if you look at it, there are a couple of periods where it levels off a little bit as we've hit the debt, debt ceiling and then we've run it up again. Now, during that time, we've had Republicans in control. We've had Democrats in control. We've had mixed, uh, mixed and matches. We've had various combinations. The bottom line is neither party has, has done anything to prevent our debt from going out of control. So when one party says, oh, we, we had a great administration, well, let me tell you something. If at the end of the year... I'm three trillion dollars in debt. There may be some people. There may be some people who are associated with me that got rich, but I don't consider it a good year if I put my family in debt. So we we can't listen to what they're saying anymore because of what they're doing. Yeah, I, I, and I don't think we can shame them into it. I don't think like we can like give them any more time and and, and just hope that you know they'll um, all of a sudden discover their true inner self and, and grow a spine or something. I, I don't think. I don't see that happening. I mean, there are, there are a handful of good people in there. I'm not saying they're all bad or they're all totally evil, but I mean, I just think they're um, incompetent and uh, and um, so yeah, it, they, they just you know they're not going to get it. I mean, even if they had, even if there's a one percent turnout um, and they still got elected that way, I don't think they would really feel any shame whatsoever at all. I think they would go about business as if they got you know, an 80% turnout and, and, and victory. That's just my personal opinion. But now what about um, uh, the, you know, so we talked a little bit about the economy, the debts, um, you know, if you have a money tree Tom, that... Tom, can I interrupt you at the risk of being rude? I want to make a point on what you just said. Yeah. Very important. Please do, yeah. The Democrats and Republicans would love a low voter turnout because the people who turn out will be people who will benefit from them being elected. As a party, they do not want a high turnout. Now, they want enough of a turnout in their party to win this election. But if we have a large turnout, look, most Americans don't even get involved. If there's a large turnout, these people who have, who have dropped out of the system, as they re-engage, they're looking for something different besides the Democrats and the Republicans. So I just wanted to point that out. They're happy with a, with a low turnout. And, 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 and we say they're spineless. We, not really. They have the backbone to stand up there and look us in the face and tell us they're looking out for us when we know that all they're doing is making their special interests and the members of their party wealthy or giving them special privileges. So they'd be happy with a low turnout. And I, I'm concerned as a libertarian candidate that uh, they're going to get a low turnout, and that's the kind of thing that's going to hurt myself and other third-party candidates because people would just be so frustrated and aggravated with the system, they're not going to get involved. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is better than any get-rich-quick scheme, and this really is, I mean, it's free, it's just you got to put forth the effort into something that you really believe in, and um, and, and luckily, in this time and day and age, you know, of course, we don't have to, you know, carry our muskets or whatever, you know, I mean, this is really just in the streets, getting the information out there, being passionate, being informed, because how can you make a you know good decision if, if you don't have all the information to make that decision? And um, and that's another thing. I mean, there's not a lot. It seems like it's just reverse. The government wants to know everything about us, but we can't know anything about them. And we're so how can we expect to you know run it? It seems like the Congress doesn't want to take any control of everything. They let agencies and people that are appointed make the laws, and and, and they don't even barely want to pass the budget. It's just like you, you know. 
I mean, it, they're like uh, slothful, lazy, you know, slow-moving things. But like you said, it's probably not incompetence. It's probably more contempt because, yeah, they look us right in the face and and uh, just want to, you know, talk you again into voting for them. <laughs> I mean, just one more time. Just uh, let's give it another whirl and, you know, see how much more money we can throw out the window. So. <laughs> Um, well, now, um, so, so, well, what is some of your, um, like, uh, favorite uh, people in history, like, um, or, or that's living nowadays, and why, and, or just interesting people, I, I would say, instead of favorites? I, I refer to some, and I quote some every now and then, or, or I kind of quote, I'm sure I don't get it exactly right, but all the patriots, all the people who are willing to sign their name and, and, and do what they had to do to give us this freedom, I respect every one of them, and I'm thankful for, if, if my contribution to society or to, to this country, to this republic, to this nation, is one-tenth of one percent of what they've done, then I, I'll be honored to have done that, because those guys were awesome, okay? And I respect our military people. I respect our guys who are over there defending freedom and, and defending this nation, even though they know that, that, that the leaders of our nation are throwing stuff out. I quote Henry Kissinger sometimes. People like Henry Kissinger. People didn't like Henry Kissinger. But Henry Kissinger once said, if something's going to be discovered inevitably, then it must be discovered immediately. Or if something has to happen inevitably, it must happen immediately. It, it's an argument against kicking the can down the road. And all my life, and, and folks who know me will tell you this, do not come whining to me about a problem. Because when you get me involved, I'm going to go solve it. And, and that's how, you know, at one point they were going to close the school here, and I know I'm digressing, but at one point they were going to close, close the local school here in our area, and they were doing that so that they could integrate some higher grades, some higher test scores into some of the inner city schools that were hitting lower scores. Now, I'm for helping all children, don't get me wrong, but I don't want to bring any children down so that statistically we can bring folks up. What we need to do is bring those kids up, work on what we're providing to them. So some folks asked me about it. And, you know, we kept the school open. We had to go down there. We had to protest. We had to demand the resignation of the superintendent. But my point is, if something must be done inevitably, as Henry Kissinger said, it must be done immediately. And I'm an immediate kind of person. Uh, to quote Barney Fife, and I know people think this is funny and corny, but we got to nip it in the bud. We have things in this going on in this country that if we had nipped it in the bud, we wouldn't be dealing with these problems now. A perfect example is Social Security. I'm going to go ahead and get on this issue. Our government has taken over $5 trillion out of the Social Security Fund for other, other spending. Now, you and I have paid Social Security in. It's our money. It's not like it's an entitlement. It's not like it's welfare. It's an investment program. Having said that, since they've robbed our money, they've taken our money, now their answer to, to their response to our questions is, hey, you guys can work till you're 70 and pay some more in. That's like a criminal coming into your house, stealing your TV. You know where it is, you know who got it, who has it, but he doesn't have to bring it back. You just have to work extra overtime to buy you a new one. That's unacceptable. So my point is, these problems, quoting Henry Kissinger again, these problems, uh, they must yeah, be solved immediately. That, that's someone who, I guess like you said, they have a spine, it's just, um, you know, they're just... Um, not representing uh, we the people, obviously, and uh, so yeah, we need more people who are going to do that. More people are going to call people out who are doing that, and they're going to stick to the oath and uh, they're, um, you know, to protect and defend the Constitution and, uh, and and just be honest people that are and, and you know people that are willing to have honest uh, debate and conversation as well, and. Um, uh, with you know, so it would be great if um, you know you went to the Congress and um, and and you had some you know compatriots like from around the country who are also independents, libertarians, Green Party people who can agree on certain issues like our civil liberties and uh, and um, you know whether we're a republic or an empire and um, and a lot of the spending. I, I mean for. Um, you know, security, I, I mean, there's, we can still have good security without, you know, living in a big brother, you know, 1984 type states where we have television monitors talking to us in the streets constantly and TSA, um, y you know, groping, uh, which they want to take, you know, they want to take them to the highways and stuff too, you know, they could be right in, in front of your front door, your driveway, so... Um, but, and, you know, 30,000 drones um, being, you know, when eventually are they going to have some kind of, you know, small tactical weapon on there? I mean, I'm sure they're probably already thinking about ways to put tasers on there and stuff. And uh, 
So there's a lot of issues going on, you know, with security, privacy. I mean, we're really asking that question that Benjamin Franklin said, you know, for those who give up um, a little bit of a uh, liberty for a little bit of security, they'll end up with neither. And, um, and that makes sense. And we can be strong by having an open uh, society. I mean, that actually would be, you, you know, um, the ideal, actually. And it really does bring out geniuses from across the country that can collaborate together and uh, and, and get to it, like you said. Um, and um, so, I mean, if we have our freedoms back, then it's not as much of a sacrifice, I guess you could say. And um, at least you'll be in there championing these ideas. I mean, it might not all happen in overnight, but things can happen rather quickly the way we have our election system. And isn't this a way to, to hold it accountable? And I know some people also don't believe in voting, but um, I mean, we are, you, you know, here together um, based on the fact that, um, you, you know, we are kind of like in a community and, and we've gotten together through elected representation uh, and, and we need a cl clean house and perhaps we need to have more oversight and transparency and more checks and balances even more. I mean, I'm not saying it's a perfect situation. Of course, there is, you know, modes and chances for corruption because we're definitely in a corrupted state right now. Um, there's a lot of corruption going on. So um, first we need to get people in there. I mean, like I said, if, if we don't vote, then they'll just keep doing it. I mean, um, I guess, you know, if we all decide just to protest or something, I guess, you know, that, but this seems easier. Maybe you could do both. <laughs> Any thoughts on people, um, you know, not voting uh, and deciding, you know, that's um, their way to protest? Um, I, I, people say that, but and, and I, I have a problem with that. Here's the reality of this, okay? We talked earlier about why Congress only has two years. Congress has two, senators have six, president has four. And the reason that that was established like that is so that no political party to dominate the government for an overly long or uh, you know, an extended period of time. So we, we can change the, the branches, the makeup of the branches of government uh, independently of what's going on in the other branches, and it gives the people more control. The problem is this. The things that the people, that, that our patriots died for in 1776 and those other years, we have just given away because we're just too lazy to get off our butts and participate in democracy. And you know what? We're getting exactly what we deserve. And when Americans realize, you know, to quote, and I don't know who said it, but I saw this on the wild on a 9-12 meeting, I think. If not me, who? If not now, when? If every American would take that position in the context of national pride and responsibility, we turn this country around overnight. Problem is, you can't get people off their dust to get involved. And they can make all the excuses they want. They can say it'll never change. I don't care. I don't buy any of that. If they have energy to go to a football game, if they have energy to watch TV, if they have energy to, to go to a casino, they should have the energy to, energy to engage and to participate. If you don't participate, just keep your mouth shut. You know? I mean, I, I, know, that's, I know there are people who say, well, I shouldn't have to vote. You do have to vote, even if there are only two party choices, even if there are two choices, you still have to vote. And as more and more people become engaged, they're going to they're gonna understand the details behind these issues. And as they understand the details, you'll have quality candidates coming forward, and they'll be supported by people who want quality government. I mean, look what happened with the Nazis in Germany. I mean, you know, I mean, just, admit, yeah, just, you know, don't get involved and don't vote and just, you know, it, it's, they didn't really have a choice just to, you know, opt out, you know, so... I mean, so, you know, this, you know, you can ignore politics, but it's not always going to ignore you. And um, so this is a way to, um, you know, a way to fight back. Now, I do understand the end goal of, like, you, you know, the, eventually we'll just have one rule and they'll be the golden rule. And maybe in a hundred years or something, that could be attainable. I'm not disagreeing with that. But we are in a democratically elected republic and, um, and we do have means to get our government back. Um, I mean, and it, one easy way is by taking back Congress where we can focus on districts you know, and you know the presidential election. I mean, you, you know, who knows? I, I, you know, hope Gary Johnson wins. But, you, you know, but the Congress, we can. I think it's attainable, and it's um, and and if we, 
involve making a national campaign, I mean, maybe we will get, you know, 50, 100, who knows? I don't know. But, I mean, there's 535 people in Congress. I mean, you know, shouldn't at least 100 of them really represent us instead of, like, five that there is now? I mean, so what about... Night, like I mean, you're totally different on issues. I mean, there's a night and day difference, and it's not like, I mean, you're actually going in there because you're a true believer. I mean, geez, this, you know, you're not going to rip people off. I mean, you're totally, you know, outspoken about, against uh, corruption and stuff like that. That's what we need, and we need someone who's willing to do that. And um, like, what about um, what's your positions on the drug war and um, and abortion? Um, I do not believe in the legalization of drugs. I, I think that we're spending way too money, uh, much money on this war on drugs. I think that we need to look at, at changing some of the, the penalties that, that we're placing on a lot of young people for making a stupid decision. And I'm going to tell you why. Now, this is, and this is public record. There was a point in my life when I had a problem with substance abuse. So my personal experience is that that is a road to nowhere. You know, we have enough drugs. We, we have other things, things in this country that are, that are causing problems for our young people that they take for the rest of their lives. And here's what I'm getting at. I asked three young men the other day, I was in a barber shop getting a haircut, there were three young men there, they were 17, 18, you know, late teens, and I asked them what they were looking forward to when they become 21. All three of them said they wanted to go drinking. We market these abusive substances and addictive substances from, to our kids from the time they're old enough to watch a football game. So I have a problem with that. Okay, well, let me ask you this. Uh, what about states' rights as far as that goes? Um, do you think states should be able to regulate how they want to regulate those drugs? Tom, I believe in states' rights. Absolutely. And, and let me say this. As, as we talk about my well, standards... Then, then actually, then I, I think then a lot of people could, you, you know, find that as a reasonable position better than the status quo. I mean, I would say this. As far as marijuana, I know, like, you know, crank and some of these other things, like... Um, the, the meth that people are taking are really bad, but um, I mean, there's half the people in this country is admitted using it, and um, there are people that are in prison right now um, that we pay forty thousand dollars for plus that are possibly being separated from their husbands, wives, children um, that uh, are in there for victimless crimes. Now, if there's a victim in the crime, hey, I, I mean, if it's proven without a reasonable doubt, I mean you know, for murder and rape, I think they should get the death penalty. But I'm just saying, if there's a victimless crime, um, I mean, maybe, you know, rehab or something, it would be cheaper than $40,000. Um, Tom, I'm going to interrupt you. I agree with you 100%. Yeah, because prison, I don't think, is the answer for a victimless crime. No, I don't think anyone should be in, in jail for a victimless crime. Especially when there's families and stuff involved. I mean, kids and husbands and wives. And but, Tom, I, I have to interrupt you again because I want to make sure that the, I'm not trying to be rude, but I want to make sure that folks who listen to this interview my opinion on all these issues, and I want to be clear about it. I want you to, yes, absolutely. We've turned prison into a profitable industry for those who are in the prison industry. Okay, that's what we've done. There are people who make lots of money off of our prison system. They don't make money unless there are prisoners there, and, and they are connected to political parties. So we have to take this penalty for profit mentality out of our system. Yeah. I mean, a lot of folks are in jail for the reason that people are making money off them being there. Oh, there's a lot of departments that, like, if they, if they don't spend the same amount they did last year, they won't get as much money, so they make excuses to spend more, so their, you know, budgets keep increasing, and, you know, so there's, there's just that whole very nature of things um, going on, you know, the wrong but, kind of incentives. Yeah. Well, let me give you an, an example specifically. Uh, in a couple of prisons around the country, I think Atlanta's one of them, if you want to call your family from the phone in prison, if you're a prisoner, okay, you have to buy minutes from a specific provider of phone minutes. It doesn't matter if your family's getting a better deal with another. This company has the contract for this prison. Now, that's not a security risk to let somebody use any cell phone provider they want, but it's manipulating these folks while they're in prison for the purpose of making money for those who are in a position to benefit from their contracts. And that's what this country has become, Tom. We yeah, have become the government prisons. that can make you wealthy. The private pris there's private prisons trading on the stock markets. So, I mean, um, you're right. They get wealthy through the government, which actually, in a sense, it's, it's taking money from your competitors for your own uh, marketing purposes and so that's totally anti-competitive I mean if there's could be anything more anti-competitive um, I mean that's right up there with it uh, 
Oh, all right. Well, that I think that's very reasonable, and um, it's it's definitely better than how we're looking at it now. I mean, I really think it's an education type of thing. Um, and um, but um, what and and also industrial hemp. I'll say that that is illegal and should you, you know that should be um, recognized as something that doesn't get people high. And uh, uh, but what about um, abortion? Here's another you know friendly issue thrown your way. I want to I want to make one more comment on that. Sure. Hemp, hemp was, was made illegal, was criminalized, when DuPont established nylon as a source of rope. It was, a, it was an effort to remove the competition from DuPont. And a lot of folks don't know that, but, but that's how that happened. Look, yeah, because nylon, before, nylon, before we go to abortion, I, represent the, I will represent the 4th Mississippi District. Having said that, and this is very important, I'm going to Washington as a blank chalkboard. Now, my construction, my frame... People know what that is. But I represent what the people of the 4th Mississippi write on that chalkboard. They write what they want on that board. And it's my function as that board to get those things accomplished in Washington. Now, there are certain standards. Like I said, there are certain standards I won't, I won't violate. And if folks disagree with me on those, they don't need to vote for me. I'm not going to compromise on some of my personal standards. But my point is, if the people of the 4th Mississippi District want to legalize things, and that's what they want, then I will represent that. Because in so many, so many times, this is a problem. These guys go to Washington, and they only represent themselves and the people who are giving them money, their special interests. I will go to Washington to represent the wishes of the 4th Mississippi District. Now, getting to abortion. I personally oppose abortion on demand. I oppose, uh, is it a government issue? We'll, we'll, we'll leave that to the people of the district. Let them make that decision. But here's the thing. I'm certainly opposed to the tax dollars paying for abortion. And, and people say, well, gosh, Ron, you're not, you're not supportive of a woman's right to choose. I'm not attacking women. But, Tom, let's face it. Contraceptives are available on every corner, every convenience store. You know, the right to choose happens before the pregnancy. You can choose to get pregnant or not. We need some responsible behavior. What we're doing is, there again, we're rewarding or uh, providing for irresponsible behavior. And there's a lot more associated with that type of behavior than just a child. I mean, we have sexually transmitted diseases that are, are costing us lots of money, but worse than that, they're costing us American lives, you know? So, so I'm opposed to abortion. I believe in a woman's right to choose not to get pregnant. Now, in the case of rape or incest, i got to be honest with you, Tom, if that were to happen to my daughter, I could not force her to, to carry full-term something that reminded her every day of that, is, of that incident. So that's something that I would pray about, we'd talk to a doctor about, and I would trust the good Lord to let us make the right decision for our family. And, and that's, what, that's how I stand on abortion. Yeah, and hopefully, I mean, for instances like that, I mean, you know, they could use a morning-after pill because... Now, Ronald Paul, who I mean, Ron Paul, who's a doctor, says that's not considered an abortion either, um, because it prevents the conception. It's it, it 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 what it does is, because it the, the conception doesn't happen right away. It usually takes like a a day or something. I think I don't know a hundred percent, but I think it takes a while. And um, but what this thing, uh, the morning after pill does, is it prevents that conception from even happening in the first place. That's all it does. Um, and so, yeah, maybe there's other solutions in the future. Education. I mean, I can understand that, too, about the rape and the incest. Um, that makes perfect sense. Um, and uh, life of the mother as well. And I can understand not wanting a force on demand. I definitely can understand not wanting taxpayer dollars because that's kind of like goes against people's religious beliefs, um, their tax dollars being used for. And, um, but I can also understand, you know, letting it up to, like, to a point, because, I mean, you don't want, you know, back alley abortions and stuff like that either happening again. So, um, so yeah, I mean, that's, I, I guess right now, I think the status quo is probably where a lot of people are, but, I mean, there's still, I think, you know, some things to learn about the principles of human life and where it begins and, and things that, I mean, it is a good debate, and, and I think people need to explore, and, and you know, some people are sure that, um, you know, we are um, already known before we were even born, so, and then some people believe it starts, you, you know, later, um, but, um, so, yeah, okay, so thanks for, for answering those questions, um, and um, now, um, uh, um, let, let me interrupt you and go back to this abortion. Okay. 
something that I would like to see. Look, here's the thing about a lot of these things that we're doing. Our nation has become dependent upon them, and they're, they're intrinsic to our society and the way we operate. So we'll, we'll gradually remove ourselves from these things as we, as we bring people back into the, the realm of responsibility. But in the case of abortion right now, if, if we left the laws as they are, I would sponsor or author a bill that would require that if a woman has an abortion, she must go to a class and she should she should name the father okay we need to press for that if she if that's possible and i don't know why it wouldn't be possible except in the case of rape but she needs to go to classes that teach her how she became pregnant you know people say well you have a lot of young kids who don't know they're not taught that in school well you know that may be right because there are a lot of families where the parents are completely absent for whatever reason so there are a lot of young people who don't know it's very important that we educate kids to show up for that system once it's over with we need to make sure that they understand in detail so that it doesn't happen again yeah, does that make sense yeah unless if it's rape of course and um and uh and also i mean do you believe this different states can you know legislate that differently i guess because um you know most criminal justice things are handled at the state anyways even in other types of things so Absolutely, I do. I, you know, look, I'm a strong, strong, strong supporter of states' of states' rights. Now, I'm glad you brought that up because I want to say something about states' rights. A lot of people say that you know the federal government really isn't necessary except to de- defend our borders as a whole. Then, yeah. But here's the thing about states' rights, and this is I remember when we turned seeing the footage of German shepherds and fire hoses being shot at children simply because they were trying to go to school. Now, whether you agree with desegregation or not, okay, I do. I agree with desegregation. Uh, I think we're we're a nation of all colors. Okay. And it's yeah, it's public tax dollars as well, of course, and yeah. Well, absolutely, but I do not want to go back to a position where states that are dominated by ideologies of hate can exercise that hate towards one segment of society or another. I believe in freedom. I believe in liberty. I believe if you're paying tax, you're... And, and it'll always come back to you too. I mean, anything that's kind of like a universal law. I, I mean, you, you know, when 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 we start um, treating others without their rights, that's just going to happen to you if you keep doing it. You know. Absolutely, that slippery slope is something we'll all fall off of if we're not careful. You're right, Tom. Uh, it definitely will. And plus, I mean, why? Want, we want to be like that anyways i mean we are on in an infinite universe i mean i mean seriously just quoting ronnie king can't we all get along and uh and and i'd say something about the states rights too i mean just to, because i think that here's a something that hasn't been said in the conversation i mean i see it as 50 laboratories of freedom i see it as a check and balance kind of like a fourth branch of government where like you know if they're going too far on the tsa or stuff there you know they can fight back if you don't like the drug laws you can do that, you know, and, and etc. Um, so, if you want to do insurance differently there, or just whatever the reasons are, and um, and that way people can learn from different states, because a lot of states do learn from each other. Like they'll they'll like the way a certain a states doing something, or they can learn from a mistake from another state, and that way it doesn't affect us all. But there is one thing about the federal government that it is guaranteed to protect. It's all the constitutional amendments that have to do with your rights. So, I mean. So I think a lot of people feel like, I mean, as far as, um, like, you, you, you know, if, if states' rights means, like, racism or, or prejudice, um, and I don't think um, it, it can mean that. It's just like some people can take Islam to mean terrorism, or some people don't. Some people can take, you know, even Christianity to mean things like an Inquisition and stuff like that, and other people view it totally different. And in all religions, I mean, there's different sects that... Uh, range um so i mean it's just this is kind of the same way and um and so i mean states rights can mean um y- you know being with the constitution um but uh and also being a check and guard for the constitution in, in other words and um i think one thing is like that like i think it would be you know almost better if like the civil rights um act was just made uh like maybe an amendment maybe you know if it's that important let's just make it an amendment get it over with and uh and that way you know because that's the core of the debate that a lot of people don't get i mean they're you know they're arguing over the principle it's not quite like you know they're displeased with the results of everything and would still like them to improve and a lot of people um feel that as a threat to them um and and they shouldn't um you, you know in fact 
just like we're talking about getting involved they should get involved and um and really um y you know take control of the issue and, and and put it in their direction um because it's just another mechanism it's not the, the thing itself it's like guns don't kill people it's the people that kill people and uh and so this is just another instrument of a state you know within you know um our united states of america so um that's but th that's yeah i mean that's something that's um you know to, it, it's 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 an issue where the media and, and um try to lead it in one direction when it you know that's not the only way of looking at it and um uh, so anything I forgot to mention here in closing here, uh, Ron, and uh, it's been a pleasure, but uh, anything else that I might have skipped over here? A um, couple things. I don't know if Project Vote Smart has my political courage test answers back on the screen. They were doing some evaluating of some other responses, and we're going to put that, was going to put that data back on the screen. But if they do, feel free to use my answers, okay? That's a great source. A couple things I do want to talk about. Everything that we have talked about on this, during this interview has been, a, the problems we're talking about has been a direct result of, of voters and American people voting for these parties and then turning our backs and letting them do whatever they want, not holding them accountable. Uh, you know, it's easier just to go vote for the guy, guy who had the slickest commercial. Uh, you know, I get a lot of folks asking me, what are you going to do for me if you're elected? They want a special deal. They want, they want an unfair competitive advantage in their business. They want us to do something. I'm not going to do that. I'm not their candidate. If they're looking for somebody like that, I'm not their guy. We have got to put our government back to the function of protecting our borders, providing for those things that are better provided for as a group other than an individual. And everything else, government needs to just get out of the way. They need to get completely out of it. So I wanted to make that point clear. And then the next thing I want to talk about is war. Okay, war is a horrible thing. We send our young men and women to die. And I don't, I'm not sure why we do that for every cause. You know, uh, we're in, we were in Iraq, and we're having to pay people to let us fight them. And in essence, that's what we do. When we go, when we go to these little skirmishes, and they're kind of like the Vietnam War. They're, they're wars for profit. They're not wars for liberty. They're not wars for society. They're wars for profit. There are some groups that profit big time off this, like big time. Yeah. Absolutely. And here's the thing. You know, I remember during, I was young during the Vietnam era. But I remember seeing our, 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 our congressman and the president talk about, we can't lose this war. If we, if we don't stay there, the world will fall into communism. Well, we lost. The world didn't fall into communism. The North Vietnam was reunited as a common state, okay? Uh, the, the, the folks were no worse off than they were yeah, they when we were there. I mean, more capitalist, if anything. Um, so they kind of just changed from within instead of being you know, invaded or <laughs> whatever, so... Yeah. Absolutely, and that was the whole gig to begin with. The people of South Vietnam didn't care. I mean, there were those who were associated with America. Look, look here's the bottom line, Tom. If, if, you're, if you're in a country and you're impoverished, and this is true in America, uh, if, if another government takes you over, if something changes, unless you're connected at the top where it's going to affect your wealth, you still have to get them to go to work every day. So my point is, we're saying, well, we can't lose in Afghanistan. Well, we're probably going to, and the world will not, corro uh, you know, will not corrode into chaos. I say bring our troops home. Let's quit paying people to fight them. I mean, let's get have it, we have to pay these people, and then we have to rebuild their country. Basically, they're profiting off the war, but we can't waste blood. Blood, man. We're talking about lives of young men and women and mothers and fathers. Oh, yeah. We I cannot do this at, for frivolous reasons. Yeah, at the beginning of these wars, they kept saying, you know, oh, there's such low casualties. Well, they're not saying that anymore, and, um, you know, we're stretching ourselves then. I mean, there is such a thing as, you know, resetting yourself and regrouping and healing, and um, just, uh, you know, that's a necessary part of life. And in history, I mean, it's a smart thing to do, plus our biggest economic, I mean, military our security threat I'll say is our budgets and um and so no one's going to attack us I mean if they do they're you know committing suicide and so we'll be just we'll be definitely fine I mean it, you know if we end these wars and uh it, yeah I mean I mean we're profiting off prisons we're profiting off wars we're not thinking of it as just a fence now it's also a way to make money yeah well and I want to I, I want to share something I want to be really clear about this as a congressman, this is a piece of legislation that I will sponsor, I will author, I will hope to push it through, and here's what it is. If the United States Congress 
for the United States Senate, if we decide to declare war and we're going to send our troops over, and it's not and it's not in response to a blatant military attack, not some terrorist group that lives inside the country, okay? A blatant government-sponsored attack on the United States or imminent threat of attack, without a doubt, then every congressman and every senator who votes to go to that war must serve at least 90 days in theater where combat is taking place. Take your 90-day leave of absence and go. If you're willing to send everybody in, if it's important enough to send our children to die, then it's important enough for us to die. Yeah, and that is something that I firmly believe in. If it's not that important, if it's not worth you fighting for it, then why does somebody else have to? I think it's very important that we determine what is worth dying for. And I know that sounds negative and morose, and I understand all that. Well, how can we defend ourselves if we can't even defend ourselves against special interests in the halls of Congress? And uh, so, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Um, I mean, we, how can we make decisions if we don't have all the information? And um, so, I mean, who runs the military? Is this civilian controlled? Are we responsible enough to control it? Um, that's the decision we'll be making. And uh you know, so if if you don't control it, somebody else will. Um, that that's that's basically what's going on, and um, and they might not have all your interests at heart. And uh, but uh, well, Ron, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you there, but uh, I mean, just how can people, you know, what's going on in in um, you, you know, your dis district four there, and uh, what's you know, any um, campaign events happening soon? Are we going to see any of the debates? I don't know that I don't know that we're going to be able to get the incumbent to show up for a debate. He's been very elusive and very unavailable. I've asked him on several media venues, but here's what here's what we need to do, Tom, and this is important. I have asked people in my district, those who support me, you know, they want to they want to send they want to contribute money, and some of them have contributed a little bit of money. But this campaign's not going to be won by money. I, I could spend a million dollars on slick commercials, and my opponent will spend two million dollars. Because they do not want to lose power. Here's what has to happen. What has to happen is folks who call themselves... Tom, you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Yep. Folks who, folks who say they care, folks who want to be involved, you can't just give somebody money and walk away. I'd rather not have your money, to be honest with you. Get on the phone. Robocalls, robocalls are really... They're impersonal. Get on the phone. Call somebody. Call 100 people in a week. And listen, you know... Uh, why don't you visit this website? Don't be a pushy salesperson. Just tell people that, that they're voting for someone and maybe they want to visit their website and, and make their own decision. We have got to make politics personal because everything that happens in Washington affects us personally. And when we, when we put it back into the personal realm and, and, and take it away from just some sort of, a, of, a, of an industri industrial thing that, you know, we really don't care about it. In fact, it's entertaining. And we have to stop expecting our candidates to pander and beg for votes. You know, here's what I stand for. I had a guy call me the other day, wanted me to contribute some money to a, some kind of a drawdown or something. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't like an impoverished charity or anything like that. It was, it was middle class folks or middle class and upper. And, and the call was, well, man, if you contribute, you might get some votes. Tom, I'm not their candidate. I'm not, here to buy no, I'm not asking for that. I mean, that to, to me, that's like, I mean, what, what, what is the payback? Why am I interviewing these candidates here? Am I getting paid right now to do this? No, I'm not. Um, and um, you know, it's probably going to take me an hour or two to, you know, to process the recording and all that and put it up. You know, the reason why is because I, I, I think just after thinking of all the different options, the pros and the cons, I mean, if, if we can have a world, you know, without some unnecessary wars, if there can be less corruption, if we can have more direct control over our uh, governments through the Congress, we the people, and have people, you, you know, representing us, if we can envision a more free country, um, you know, live free, um, be free, um, you know, just live in a free country um, again, and... Uh, that would be, um, you know, I'm sure we will all rise in that tide. Um, you know, it may take a couple years, but it, and it'll be better for future generations. And, I mean, it'll just be a win-win. Um, and this is something that is not going to be won by money because people actually have to vote. I mean, if you can't get out of bed, then do, you know, um, a mail, you know the mail-in vote, the absentee voting. I mean, just, um, just you know, vote, uh, you know, so at least buy a stamp and do a mail-in vote if you don't feel like standing in line. And, and I like to use the term one plus five. My vote plus five. 
I'm gonna I'm going to cast my vote, and, I'm, and it, it's my goal, it's my obligation to get at least five other individuals. Yeah, like network marketing, and those five can get other five. You know, if we do a one plus five. If the Libertarian Party would exercise a one point five mentality of its membership, then then we have this election in the bag. Yeah, and that can be like I don't you know know about that as far as business, but but as far as like political campaigns, I mean that's a great idea. I mean this is really word of mouth. Things spread can spread really fast, like the Macarena and you know other uh, things that are cliche. I, so it can happen. It can like spread like wildfire. It just needs that spark, you know. And um, so uh, that's what it. And and then you know, then people, the whole world will really hear us. I mean, kind of like George W. Bush said. But this time, you know, it'll be you, you know uh, even better. And um, well, um, Ronald. Um, Tom, yeah. let me interrupt you. One other thing, I want to close with, if, if it's okay with you. Absolutely, please. All right. Yeah. Here's the thing, and this is going to sound cliche. I, I ran my governor's campaign on a position of honesty, okay? That's all I promised was honesty and openness and to represent what people tell me they want me to do. The same thing as a congressman, all right? And this, this is not a corny slogan. This is how I live my life. I would rather lose your vote with the truth than gain it with a lie. And so what I'm saying to folks, if you're looking for the same old thing, if you're looking for a politician who does the nod, nod, wink, wink with you while he's saying other things, I'm not their guy. If you're okay with your children being $50,000 in debt, I'm not your guy. If you really are concerned about this country, if you're concerned about our district, I'm your guy, or at least consider me. But, but that's, that, like I said, that's how I live my life if the truth is what counts. So would you please make sure you get that on there? That's important. Yeah, absolutely, and it's Ron Williams, U.S. Congress dot com, R O N W I L L I A M S, um, and uh, U.S. United States, you know, U.S. Congress dot com, and um, but we'll have your website displayed here, and um, so um, well, that's excellent, Ron. I, I mean, that we had a very informative, um, thorough interview, I believe, and um, and uh, so I think um, the case has been made. And uh, this is, uh, you, you know, the common sense. This is what's going to be um, uh, a shot heard around the world. I mean, so when we get um, our representatives back that represent us um, in there and, uh, and then, you know, take it from there. That won't be the end of it, but that will be just a, a good, healthy beginning, something that hasn't happened um, in a long, long time, and um, and that's something that's attainable that we can do just by you know reaching those five people. And um, so, Ron, thank you very much. I'll say goodbye to you real quick after this interview. I appreciate your time, and um, I hope you have an excellent uh, 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 evening, sir. Thanks. You too, Tom. Thank you for your concern, and thank you for looking out for democracy. Appreciate it.